No conversation about classic Motown acts should be complete without a mention of The Temptations. Formed in the early 1960s as a combination of members from two different groups, The Distance and The Primes, The Temptations were one of several male singing groups to make a big impact in the decade's R&B and soul music scenes. However, there were a few things that set them apart from most of the pack. Their vocal harmonies, the fact that any given member could sing lead, and their tight on-stage choreography. Those qualities undoubtedly helped them to great success, as the Temps have more than 50 hits on the Billboard Hot 100 charts, including four number one singles and 15 top 10 S. Unfortunately, the Temptations also stood out from most other vocal groups for one unpleasant reason. They were a band beset by tragedy before, during, and after their heyday. From impoverished, abusive backgrounds to substance use and abuse to untimely deaths of band members and family members alike, The Temptations have seen it all, and it's quite an impressive feat that despite all those personal and professional hurdles, they've been entertaining audiences longer than most people have been alive. So, with all that out of the way, let's look at the more tragic stories from The Temptations' six-plus decade history. Out of all the members of The Temptations' classic 1960s lineup, David Ruffin probably had the roughest childhood. Born Davis Eli Ruffin in Wynot, Mississippi on January 18, 1941, the would-be soul legend lost his mother at a very early age and grew up in poverty. His father, Eli Ruffin, was reportedly an abusive man who made David and his siblings perform at churches as a singing group. And while his older siblings allegedly suffered physical abuse at the hands of the family patriarch, David and his brother Jimmy, later a successful solo singer in his own right, endeared themselves to their father through their vocal skills. Mr. Eli would take them from church to church on Sundays, and people would feel sorry for these motherless children, recalled David's niece, Gina Ruffin Moore, in an interview with the Philadelphia Inquirer. She would also share more uplifting stories about her famous uncle, relating that when David was in his early teens, he would pretend he was on The Ed Sullivan Show and ask his playmates to clap for him as he performed. For a boy who grew up without a mother and with very little material wealth, making believe that he was a popular singer was just about all he could do. That is, until he moved to Detroit in the early 60s with those childhood ambitions still very much alive. It's not too often when someone's dismissal from their group becomes life-changing in the wrong sort of way. But that's apparently what happened to original Temptations member Al Bryant, who was dismissed from the band in late 1963 after his belligerent behavior, often fueled by his heavy drinking, manifested itself one time too many. Trouble was that on top of the drinking, Al developed a bad attitude, Otis Williams explained in the book Temptations, noting that Bryant began acting out as the group's profile continued to grow. In mid-1963, Bryant attacked Paul Williams with a beer bottle after a show, but somehow remained with the group, with Paul convincing the others not to sack their increasingly troubled bandmate. But when Bryant caused yet another stir at Motown's 1963 Christmas party, the other temptations decided enough was enough. He was fired and would soon be replaced by David Ruffin. As Otis Williams related later on in Temptations, the group encountered Bryant five years later following a show at Detroit's Cobo Hall, and he was in quite a disheveled state. His hair had grown long and unruly, and there were big dark circles around his eyes, the veteran singer wrote. His skin was the color of ash. Otis also remembered detecting a deep sadness in Bryant's words when they spoke backstage on that day in 1968. Bryant was only 36 years old when he died of cirrhosis of the liver on October 26, 1975, in Florida. And then there is Paul Williams' misery. During their earlier days as a group, Paul Williams was the only member of the Temptations who abstained from alcohol consumption. He would, in fact, lecture his bandmates about ruining their health whenever he'd catch them covertly drinking. That's why it's tragically ironic that Williams descended into alcoholism as the Temps began to enjoy massive success as one of Motown's most popular acts. According to Otis Williams in Temptations, Paul's drinking problem might have started when he entered an affair with a woman named Winnie Brown, who worked as the Supreme's hairstylist. Paul had married young and had five children, Otis wrote. 
He was devoted to his family but torn between them and Winnie. Before too long, Paul, who never took anything stronger than milk, started drinking. All in all, however, Otis Williams acknowledged in his book that it's hard to pinpoint an exact cause or driving factor for Paul Williams' problems with the bottle. But as he told Deseret News in 1998, it was difficult watching his bandmate develop a drinking problem almost out of nowhere. To see a guy come from drinking milk to drinking, sometimes two to three-fifths of Courvoisier a day, that was kind of hard to take, he said. Next up is David Ruffin. Ruffin started developing some bad habits during the Temptations' peak years. While it cannot be stressed enough that his heartfelt vocals helped take the temps to much greater heights in the mid-60s, his personal issues would linger for most of his adult life and compromise his undeniable talent as one of Motown's most distinctive voices of the decade. It is believed that Ruffin's drug misuse started at some point in the 1960s, though it was only in the later part of the decade when it truly became a problem. Ruffin first entered drug rehabilitation in 1967. Two decades later, well after his and his band's heyday, the singer ended up in jail after law enforcement officials found him in possession of drugs. After violating the terms of his probation for misdemeanor cocaine possession in 1988, Ruffin, now in his late 40s, was back in rehab. He was getting so high, the man was a walking skeleton, Ruffin's friend Linster Butch Merle told the Philadelphia Inquirer, looking back on the singer's later years and how he had yet to kick his drug habit. Speaking to the same outlet, Daryl Hall of Hall and Oates shared his experiences working with Ruffin in the 1980s and sadly acknowledged that at the time, the musician was hanging with a bad crew of people who enabled his use of illicit substances. But the biggest tragedy the group ever faced was the death by suicide of member Paul Williams. Not only was Williams still dealing with alcoholism at the start of the 1970s, but the Temptations singer also suffered from sickle cell anemia, a fact he kept a secret from the group's fans, as noted by You Discover Music. The combination of these two factors made him increasingly erratic on stage, and when doctors found a spot on his liver during a 1971 checkup, Williams quit the band. It didn't help that he and his wife reportedly separated in 1972 and that he allegedly owed about $80,000 in taxes. Without a doubt, the talented singer and dancer was going through a lot of personal turmoil. Following his exit from The Temptations, Williams remained close to the group and served as their choreographer behind the scenes. He was also working on some songs in hopes of launching a solo career. Sadly, on the night of August 17, 1973, the singer was found dead at 14th and W. Grand Boulevard in Detroit, slumped in the front seat of a car with a gun in his hand. Supposedly, he had left his then-girlfriend's house a few hours prior following an argument. While there have been theories suggesting that there was foul play involved in the singer's passing, his death was officially ruled as death by suicide. But that wasn't the end of horrifying deaths in the group and those close to them by association. Despite the fact he hardly sang any lead parts on The Temptation's many classic hits, Otis Williams played, and continues to play, a key role in the group as one of its founding members, its longtime leader, and its self-described glue, as he told Rolling Stone in 2018. And he kept things together in the band despite enduring his share of personal challenges, including the end of his first two marriages and, far more notably, the untimely death of his son Lamont. Otis Lamont Miles, who made his living as a construction worker, was just 24 years old when he was killed in a workplace accident on August 8, 1985. Speaking to The Express in 2023, Williams shared that it was the thrill and satisfaction of performing live with the Temps that helped him through that difficult time in his life. I was grieving because I lost my son, but when I got up on stage, I realized I was bringing people happiness. So whatever sorrow I had within me, I let it transfer out into that audience, having a wonderful time and enjoying our music, he told the outlet. I've always taken negativity and turned it into a positive. Next up was David Ruffin, who died of an overdose of cocaine in 1991. 
Despite multiple attempts to get his life and career back on track, including a 1982 reunion tour with The Temptations that prematurely ended in part due to his flaky, drug-fueled behavior, David Ruffin was still weighed down by substance misuse in the last few years of his life. The voice behind hits such as My Girl and Ain't Too Proud to Beg died on June 1, 1991 at the age of 50, having collapsed at a crack house he visited on the night before his passing, according to the Washington Post. On June 10, the Philadelphia Medical Examiner's Office confirmed that Ruffin accidentally overdosed on cocaine. In the band biography Temptations, Otis Williams wrote about the last time he saw Ruffin alive at a Las Vegas concert just a few months before his death. David came backstage to see us after the show, and while I had known David as a drug user since the late 1960s, I didn't recall ever seeing him look so bad, Williams remembered. The drugs left him looking sunken and emaciated. Williams would later explain that he knew right then and there that Ruffin's days were most likely numbered, given his poor physical shape at the time he was catching up with his former bandmate. Just a year later, another member, Eddie Kendricks, died of lung cancer in 1992. Best known for his falsetto vocals, which he utilized to perfection on songs such as The Way You Do The Things You Do, Get Ready, and You're My Everything, Eddie Kendricks was already a shadow of his old self during the ill-fated Temptations reunion tour of 1982. At that point, his many years of heavy cigarette smoking had left him unable to reach the high notes he used to hit so effortlessly as a younger man. Nonetheless, he continued to perform live over the next several years, oftentimes with fellow ex-Temptations David Ruffin and Dennis Edwards. By the early 90s, Kendrick's health problems began to escalate, and he had one of his lungs removed in 1991, later warning young people not to smoke as he had been doing for the past three decades or so. The singer was 52 years old when he passed away from lung cancer on October 5, 1992, at a hospital in his hometown of Birmingham, Alabama. As quoted by the Washington Post, The Temptations' first manager, Esther Edwards, looked back on Kendrick's legacy as one-fifth of the group's best-known lineup. Eddie just had that great, great tenor voice that just was so captivating, she said in a statement. He had such admirers, men and women, but the ladies really loved Eddie and his style. He just had a sweet, melodious, captivating, tender sound. Following the respective deaths of David Ruffin and Eddie Kendricks in 1991 and 1992, a third member of the classic Temptations lineup passed away in the 1990s. Melvin Franklin, the Temps' longtime bass singer who at that point had been with the group since its inception, died on February 23, 1995, at the Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles at the age of 52. His cause of death was listed as heart failure, though his condition was also exacerbated by diabetes. That left Otis Williams as the sole surviving temptation from the group's original lineup. Toward the end of his eponymous Temptations biography, Williams looked back on the death of his best friend of more than three decades, offering a short but touching tribute to their many years as buddies and bandmates. I loved all the Temptations like brothers, but it was Melvin who had stood shoulder to shoulder with me through the good times and the bad, Williams wrote. After Eddie died, there were two surviving original members, and that meant that Melvin and I each had someone who could understand who we were and how we felt. There were many things between Melvin and me that didn't even need to be said. There have been several former temptations from the group's later lineups who have since passed away. However, Dennis Edwards' death in Chicago on February 1, 2018, just two days before what would have been his 75th birthday, was particularly notable for reasons beyond the fact he was the group's lead voice during its successful psychedelic soul era in the late 60s and early 70s. Edwards's official cause of death was complications from meningitis, but as reported by the Detroit News, an emergency protection order filed in January of that year alleged that the singer was neglected and abused by his wife, Brenda, in the months leading up to his passing. Some of the disturbing allegations from the order included claims that Brenda took away her husband's hearing aids, cell phone, and iPad, and an even more chilling accusation that she tried to suffocate him by holding his head face down on the bed. 
Isa Pointer Stewart, Edward's daughter with fellow singer Ruth Pointer, also claimed she didn't hear anything about meningitis from her father's doctors. Brenda Edwards denied the accusations, issuing a statement to the Detroit News that read, I loved Dennis, and we were married for 18 years. I would have never done anything to harm him. These allegations are false and defamatory and will be proven as such. Her name was cleared later in 2018, as officials found no evidence of the purported abuse. Despite the group's heartbreaking end, their songs still live on over six decades after the band was formed. Precisely, it's been 60 years since The Temptations made their first appearance on the Billboard R&B charts with their first release on Motown, You're My Dream Come True, a soulful ballad written and produced by Barry Gordy. That song peaked at number 22, earning The Temps a spot on Gordy's Motortown Review and setting the wheels in motion for what even now remains one of the most successful singing groups the world has ever known. Within a decade of releasing You're My Dream Come True, they'd sent four singles to the top of Billboard's Hot 100 as their sound evolved from early hits as iconic as My Girl to the more ambitious psychedelic soul of such classics as Cloud Nine, which earned Motown its first Grammy and Ball of Confusion. Among their legendary songs is the hit Psychedelic Shark, released in 1969. Never let it be said that The Temptations met the psychedelic 60s halfway. Their intentions are written all over this special effects-laden relic of a very funky trip in Dayglow Paisley letters as they sing the praises of a place that's guaranteed to blow your mind. It's even got a neon sign outside that says, Come in and take a look at your mind. Producer Norman Whitfield co-wrote Psychedelic Shack with Barrett Strong, whose recording of Money That's What I Want a decade earlier was Motown's first hit single. The Temptations were fully invested in bringing their vision to life with conviction to spare, while the Funk Brothers supplied one of their more insistent psychedelic grooves. This one peaked at number 7 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number on the R&B charts. The next hit song is It's Growing, which dropped a few years earlier in 1965. If you've ever heard the song, you will agree with me that the toy piano intro is sublime. Most people will be hooked before the first words escape David Ruffin's mouth as he tries to capture the extent to which his love for you is growing every day. And speaking of those lyrics, they could scarcely be more instantly identifiable as the work of a young Smokey Robinson, who co-wrote this gem of a love song with the miracle's Pete Moore. Sample line, like the size of a fish that the man claims broke his reel, it's growing. Robinson was coming off a huge Temptations single, My Girl. This one didn't do as well, but a few songs have. It's Growing peaked at number 18 on the Hot 100. The next song, Loneliness Made Me Realize It You That I Need, was released in 1967. This richly orchestrated masterstroke was brilliantly produced by Whitfield, who wrote the song with Edward Holland Jr. It also features one of Motown's most distinctive bass lines. You could make a solid case for the extent to which James Jamerson outgrooves the competition based entirely on this performance. He even manages to groove on the opening verse without a drummer, who doesn't really make his presence felt until the second verse, where the other temptations weave their way through Ruffin's desperate pleas, delivered in his legendary rasp, with an emphatic, extremely contagious refrain of, I need you slash baby, I need you. This one peaked at number 14 on the Billboard Hot 100. In 1973, the group released the song Masterpiece. Written and produced by Whitfield, this one wears its sense of self-importance on its actual sleeve. The title tells you everything you need to know about what they were hoping to accomplish here. I believe the term for that would be a baller move, and the song length definitely follows suit. 13 minutes and 49 seconds? It's pretty clear that Whitfield meant for this to be another Papa Was a Rolling Stone, his chart-topping masterpiece of the previous year, adhering closely to the formula that made that record what it was. You're nearly four minutes into a sumptuous bed of orchestrated soundtrack funk before we hear from any actual temptations, who rise to the occasion here with a heartfelt delivery of Whitfield's gritty portrait of how nobody cares what happens to folks down here in the ghetto. This one topped the R&B charts, hitting number one on the Hot 100. Another of Temptation's notable hits came in 1965, the song being Don't Look Back. 
Robinson produced this soulful gem, a song he reportedly wrote to shine a spotlight on the great and yet underutilized Paul Williams, their original lead singer, whose star had been eclipsed in the Temptations firmament by Ruffin and Eddie Kendricks. It was relegated to the B-side after DJs made their preference clear for the intended flip, My Baby, with the Red Hot Ruffin on lead vocals. My Baby outperformed it on the Hot 100 and the R&B charts, but Don't Look Back became a go-to track to close their live performances, its reputation growing through the years to where it now has more than twice as many streams on Spotify and has inspired countless covers, from Peter Tosh with Mick Jagger to Elvis Costello. Two years later, the band released All I Need. There's more than a passing resemblance to the effervescent rhythm that made the supreme song You Can't Hurry Love such a chart-topping triumph the previous summer. And although this single didn't do what the Supremes did with a similar approach, the energy of All I Need is every bit as irresistible as it builds to its inevitable climax, Ruffin in the role of the unfaithful lover vowing to undo the wrong I've done. All he needs is just to hear you say you forgive him. This one peaked at number 8 on Billboard's Hot 100, doing better on the R&B charts, where it got to number 2. A year later, the song I Could Never Love Another hit the airwaves. Their final single to feature Ruffin on lead vocals was also their second consecutive single with lyrics by Roger Penzabeen. It took the temps to number one on Billboard's R&B charts, much like that previous Penzabeen single, I Wish It Would Rain. But this one only got to number 13 on the Hot 100. Not for lack of being an exceptional recording, Ruffin clearly went out on a high with this positively tortured vocal. The intensity he brings to On My Bended Knees, I'm Begging You to Stay Here With Me is like a masterclass in desperation, underscoring the heartache of lyrics reportedly written as an open letter from Penza Bean, who died by suicide before this single was released, to his unfaithful wife. Your My Everything, released in 1967, was another memorable hit by The Tempts. Eddie Kendrick's lead vocal here could not be smoother or more soulful as he pledges his devotion to his everything on one of The Temptations' most romantic ballads, setting the tone with, You surely must know, Magic Girl, cause you've changed my life. You'd be forgiven for thinking those lyrics were Smokies, but this is the first of four Temptations singles with lyrics by Penza Bean. Ruffin grabs the spotlight on the bridge, his grittier vocal a dramatic contrast that further sets that section of the song apart, and he returns to testify over the fade-out. This one peaked at number six on Billboard's Hot 100. Then, towards the end of the 60s, the boys released Runaway Child, Running Wild. This was The Temptations' second psychedelic soul hit written by Whitfield and Strong, with Whitfield handling the production. It was a change in direction inspired by Otis Williams, turning Whitfield on to what Sly and the family were up to. There's a definite nod to psychedelic rock in the fuzz on those guitar licks, and the production is suitably trippy, pointing the way to early Funkadelic, while the lyrics represent another shift into explicitly socially relevant lyrics. A cautionary tale aimed at the runaway, it finds them siding with the parents while painting a harrowing portrait of life on the streets. You're in punishment because your mother wants to raise you in the right way, Dennis Edwards tells the runaway but you don't care because you already made up your mind you want to run away. This one topped the R&B charts and hit number six on Billboard's Hot 100. I'm Gonna Make You Love Me from 1968 is another timeless masterpiece by the band. The obvious choice for a lead single from their album-length collaboration with Diana Ross and the Supremes is a joyous cover of a D.D. Warwick hit written by Gamble and Huff with Jerry Ross and produced by Frank Wilson and Nicholas Ashford of Ashford and Simpson, who sang backup on the Warwick version. There's a playful chemistry between the groups that really serves the lyrics as Ross and Kendricks navigate the supple melody while taking turns vowing to make the other person love them. Kendrick sounds like he was born to sing that mile-high chorus, especially when he sings, and I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make you love me, just before the fade out while Ross takes a more conversational approach to the lyrics to brilliant effect. It peaked at number two on both the Hot 100 and the R&B charts. But the group's best song yet, recorded and released in 1972 and widely considered their best, is Papa Was a Rolling Stone. 
You're nearly four minutes into the practically 12-minute version of Papa Was a Rolling Stone, as it appeared on All Directions by the time the singing starts, allowing Whitfield ample time to set the mood, which is tense and dramatic, with his orchestrated soundtrack. Wah Guitar could give a person a flashback to the theme from Shaft. Then Edwards grabs the mic, setting the scene on the 3rd of September. That day I'll always remember, yes I will, Edwards continues, cause that was the day that my daddy died. As the song goes on, we eventually hear from three other temptations, Melvin Franklin and new members Richard Street and Damon Harris, creating the sensation that we're hearing from several children of a rolling stone who spent most of his time chasing women and drinking and when he died, all he left us was alone. Whitfield wrote the song with Strong and had already cut a very different, if clearly inferior version with the undisputed truth. When that recording didn't hit the way he hoped it would, he tried again. And we're all better for it. The Temptations version topped the Hot 100 and the R&B charts, going on to win three Grammys. A few years ago, the only surviving original member of the hit R&B group talked about the darker side of a legacy and the musical it inspired. One of the first times Otis Williams, the founder and last surviving original member of The Temptations, realized his music made an indelible impact on their fans occurred after he received a letter in the mail. I'm reading it, and it said to give them a call the first chance I had, Williams remembers. She got on the phone and told me she was ill and asked, God, don't take me until I speak to Otis Williams. She said she wanted to tell me how much the music meant to her before she died. I didn't have any idea when we started making this music to just have fun and make money that it'd be so emotional for people. It's a sentiment that has lasted through The Temptations' success, as they have held on to the distinction of being one of the most commercially dominant vocal groups in music history. With 14 R and B number one singles under their belts, among them, My Girl, The Way You Do The Things You Do, Cloud Nine, Papa Was A Rolling Stone, and Get Ready. As earlier covered, their music provided a soundtrack to the 60s and early 70s, helping lift up Motown records in the process. Despite launching over a half century ago, The Temptations and their legend have lately been enjoying fresh relevance. A jukebox musical based on their rise and told from the perspective of Williams, dubbed Ain't Too Proud, named after their 1966 signature Ain't Too Proud to Beg, debuted on Broadway in March 2019 and later garnered 11 Tony nominations, winning for Best Choreography. In addition, Williams was honored at the Apollo Theater's recent Spring Gala, where he was bestowed a spot on the historic Harlem Theater's Walk of Fame. Here I am, 77 years old, and I'm enjoying my life as if I'm 27, Williams said. I am profoundly blessed to be doing what I'm doing 59 years later. The singer, who grew up in Texas, packed up and moved to Michigan with his mother when he was 10 because his parents separated shortly after Williams was born. As fate would have it, he wound up in Detroit just as the city's homegrown Motown Records, founded by Barry Gordy, and named, of course, after the city's then claim to fame as the automobile capital of the world, was in its infancy. It was happenstance, Williams says, who initially found trouble in the city but later found solace in music, later founding The Temptations with its original lineup of Al Bryant, Eddie Kendricks, Melvin Franklin, and Paul Williams. It was necessary timing, and it was meant to be that God in his infinite wisdom put all of these producers, writers, and artists together at that time and made such profound music. Among that crew was Smokey Robinson, the young singer-songwriter who penned a track that would help rocket the group to superstardom. I remember we were performing at the long, defunct Detroit nightclub, The Twenty Grand, and Smokey said, I have a song for you guys. Williams recalls the birth of their signature, My Girl. When arranger Paul Reiser added the strings and horns, I came into the studio and Smokey was sitting at the console. I said, I think we have something. After its release in December 1964, the song became the act's first number one hit that March. I remember Barry Gordy, The Beatles, and The Supremes all sent telegrams congratulating us. But then, everywhere we went, we heard My Girl. It happened so much it was like, Jesus Christ, we have other songs, play something else. 
Despite their immense success and stature as RB's premier act, Williams is quick to note it wasn't always easy. We were sky high and we were enjoying what we were doing, but we started fragmenting, he says. As the musical jokes, their nickname, The Temps, eventually obtained a new meaning with a range of members cycling in and out of the band over the years. As seen earlier, longtime lead vocalist David Ruffin, younger brother of Motown solo act Jimmy Ruffin, took over for Bryant three years after their founding, while Ruffin himself was unceremoniously kicked out of the group in 1968. We started letting matter what shouldn't matter. Egos and drugs got in the way. Since their founding, 26 members have been part of the group, which still tours today. In my home, there's a big painting of a friend of mine made of all of the temptations. I stand there and look at that painting and think how I had to deal with 24 strong personalities, and here I stand today. Today, Williams stands as the last surviving member of the group's core members, with Paul Williams dying by suicide in 1973. Bryant succumbing to alcoholism in 1975, and Franklin and Kendricks passing away from various health ailments during the 90s. Ruffin, meanwhile, died of a cocaine overdose in 1991. Much like the success of the group themselves, Williams's later years are bittersweet. He's left without his bandmates, but is enjoying a newfound relevance with a feature film and global tours lined up. He also takes solace in knowing the indelible impact of his hits. This music is so lasting that even when we are no longer here, it'll still be loved, he says. It's undeniable and also something I would have never imagined. What a story. Tell us, what is your favorite hit from The Temptations? Let us know in the comments section below. And that's it from us today until next time. Thank you for watching.